new people, we have a new roster, and that's what Clarissa's handing out. The old one that's in your book from just last month is already up. <laughs> You're welcome. themselves with us. The first thing I would like to do is see if there is any public comment. Do we have anyone here for public comment? I don't have any cards. Doesn't look like it. Okay. Next is the February 17th meeting minutes. Has everyone had a chance um, to look through those and review them? Any discussion or comments? Great. Can I have a motion to approve the minutes then? I don't think we're the minutes. Okay, second. Awesome. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Great. Um, Cassandra, we could just dive you in oh, since sure. you're up already. Can we? <laughs> Almost feel redundant in a way. Yeah. <laughs> Making sure that all of our new members uh, feel very welcome. Thank you all for coming. Um, we have uh, Dennis Davis, who is not here just yet, representing um, North County, and he's the new alternate. Um, we have Miranda Douglas, who is representing Mid County, again, she is an, also an alternate. There's Catherine. Catherine Baranowski, is that that right? Alternate for South County. Carson Zimmer, who is an alternate for the professional. Christian Smith over here is alternate for the student and also from North County, which compliments our uh, Demetrius from South County. And Sonny Flynn, who is here representing the, the beaches to uh, replace Susan, who left us last month. Um, so welcome, all of you. Um, please feel um, comfortable to ask any questions that you have. Um, the staff will, will, I think we should go around the room and sort of introduce everyone. Um, and so you know that the staff uh, is here to answer your questions and we get to know your fellow track members. And it's a very open group. Um, we do really want your opinions and, and value the conversation. Um, so welcome. We also, um, since I'm up here, if I might just mm -hmm. make another announcement. Tomorrow is Driver Appreciation Day. And staff members are going to be out um, at the uh, transfer centers um, to give a little gift to the drivers. Um, we're going to bring up some thank you cards for you all. If you'd like to um, write a note on the back of them and hand them to your, your favorite driver or drivers, we'd really appreciate that. 
Um, so James will be up here in a minute, um, and for those of you who have not met him, he'll introduce himself and make sure that you, if you have a favorite driver that you thank them tomorrow, because we want to make sure that, that they are appreciated. We wouldn't be here without them. If you want to go ahead and, and go around the room, we'll go around the room so that our new members can know who everybody else is. I think that's a great idea. And just real quickly, I never like to put anybody on the spot, but next at the next meeting, if you would just take the new members, would just take a couple of minutes to introduce themselves and kind of share why you were interested in being on track, I think that would be great. I won't put you on the spot today, but if you just kind of have something in mind for next time. So starting with me, I guess, I am Elaine Mann, and I am from North County that I am chairman of the track. My name is Kim Rankin. I represent Thorpe Disabled Rapid Transit. And I'm the only representative, and I think it's great that PSA provides Thorpe so I can be out and about within the community. I'm Sunny Flynn. I'm representing the beaches, and I forward to working with all of you. you. I'm Carson Zimmer. I'm the alternate professional representative at the PSG of the Greenlight campaign, and I want to come back to this again. I'm uh, Dave Winchell, and I'm uh, representing uh, North County. Welcome all new members. I'm Yasser Petrovich. I'm the professional member of the committee. Welcome to everybody, all the new members and the old members. Gabriel and I am on South Alternate. Vivian Peters, Mid County. Brad Miller, jump in and we'll go back. Sure. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Brad Miller. I'm the CEO of PSBA. So we're here. <laughs> 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 Next up, we're doing the realignment scenario work plan with Heather. Oh, with Brad. Okay. It's Heather. Oh. Can you speak in a higher voice? That's <laughs> 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 true. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
So you can go online on our website and watch you guys live. I don't know if there's anyone watching this. But, um, or after the fact it's recorded, and then, yeah, you can watch these proceedings. People, people will be watching. Um, so that means they can watch the, the regular board then? The board yeah. Down there? And you can watch the, uh, the board downstairs, um, and the, all the committee meetings in here will now be on live stream. And before we had them, so they, they were on YouTube a couple days after the fact, and we recorded it, but now, uh, now it's as we speak. So I'll, I'll just start off by saying um, thank you guys for uh, signing up to be on track. Um, I know there's some benefits to you all because you get a bus pass, a free bus pass, so that's a great thing. But this is an incredibly important committee and um, for two reasons. One is you all are providing the rider perspective to the PSTA board. The board is who I report to, is my boss. The 15 members, almost all of them are elected officials, mayors, county commissioners, city councilmen from around Pinellas County who come and meet, when I said downstairs, down in the boardroom once a month, and they adopt, make policy decisions. And those policy decisions that affect the riders that have something to do with the service we provide, well, all those items will come to you first. And you will be able to provide opinion. If you don't like something, which I would imagine you're probably not going to like a fare increase or something like that, you have an opportunity to, to vocalize that. And the, the board very much appreciates your input. So that, that's the main reason for track. The second reason is, there's a second reason, and that is um, that in one sense, you guys are the most favored or in some way, at least on Thursday, on uh, Tuesdays at 4 o'clock, the most important riders of our 45,000 people that are riding the bus today. You guys are very important. It is, if you have a problem or if you, you see something out riding the buses, that you think is not good or good or whatever, um, you should be able to contact uh, Jeff, who's over, the, who's over the operator, or James Bradford, our chief operating officer. Or if there is some kind of um, idea that you have uh, about a new route or a new development or something that you think needs, then contact Cassandra or Chris, or whatever, get to know these folks and to feel like you you have a direct access into the big, huge, monolithic PSTA. Um, please do that. Please contact me. Um, you know, I can't promise I'll get back to you in any kind of reasonable thing, so contact the other folks as much faster. But um, I very much, I very much enjoy coming to these meetings and hearing from you guys. So a little thing happened last November called Greenlight Pinellas, and it was not passed, right? Um, I think most of you probably know that. We've talked a lot about that uh, at track over the last year. And I would say over the last four months, um, November, December, January, and February, the, a lot of the discussions at track and at the PSDA board about is exactly what happened. Why didn't, it, why didn't the Greenlight uh, vote pass? Greenlight, of course, would have gotten a much uh, bigger, better transit system. The routes would come more frequently. And now, so the, now the question is, what are we going to do in the future? And we've had some, I would say, fits and starts uh, over the last month or so, where you know the, fi the financial situation for PSTA running its buses um, is now in serious question. Greenlight Pinellas was a way to provide more funding, which we were able to buy the, the buses we needed, hire the, the bus drivers we needed, and to run the service. Well, without Greenlight, it looks like we will have much tighter budgets out into the future, and we have some serious decisions to make. Some people are saying that we should be already cutting the service. We should cut the service immediately down to size. Others are saying, um, no, we need to be talking about 
news, you know, uh, doing something else uh, instead of green light. And there's been a lot of debate about that. There's a lot of things going on. Like I said, there's some there are some folks that say we need to be cutting the service, making the changes right away, because the sooner we make them, the better off we'll be. We have a budget process. We're we're a governmental agency that runs that runs the transit system in Pinellas County, and we have a budget that we have to um, a budget is a financial plan for next year. We have we have a fiscal year that starts on October one. So we have to have the budget approved by October 1, and the planning for that, to get that approved, starts now. Starts in the springtime and goes throughout the summertime. The bus system in Pinellas County is funded primarily by a property tax, a property tax on people's homes and businesses. So it's a, it's a very small property tax compared to how much we pay for schools and your city government. But there's a very small uh, property tax line item on your uh, on property in Pinellas County, and that uh, that is what our budget has to approve, and that get, that's required by the state of uh, Florida on exactly the process we have to follow to get input over that over the summertime. Some folks are say, telling me, some board members are telling me, well, we just have to work on the budget. That, that's we have to work on the budget and figure out what we can do to make sure we have a balanced budget, and that should be the priority. And then, of course, everyone, I think a lot of people, everyone wants to do it, but some people say that the priority really should be, let's let's spend a lot of time talking to the public and getting more input from the public, from, from riders, like you all, and non-riders, and see what they have to say, and how, how we should reposition PSDA. What I am recommending, after hearing from all of the board members, uh, and you all and and others is that we step back from all th all those things and first develop a path forward, a policy document, a a game plan for where the board wants to go first at a very high level, not each route or anything like that, but at a high level and see if the board can get consensus. Uh, on a path forward first. So set the policy first, then we'll go through the budget process this summer, and then, but then we'll kind of hold off on changing the routes until we have a comfortable place that we know where we're going. For the last three years, when anyone asked any of the board members, or me, or probably Elaine, or anyone, so what's PSEA doing? Oh, they're doing Greenlight Pinellas. They're working on Greenlight Pinellas. And now, people are saying, oh, so what's going on over there at PSDA? And people say, I don't know, nothing. Or they don't know. And so we're trying to identify what we're doing. What I'm going to recommend is that we at least come up with a game plan on what we're doing that's relatively short. We're not probably going to be able, I'm not recommending we go ahead right away and start a whole another 30-year plan like Greenlight. A green light too. That might change, you know. Over in Tampa, they're talking about having a vote. They're talking about them having a vote in 2016, and so maybe that will change things over here in Pinellas. But for now, I'm, I'm recommending that we come up with a plan that's like two to three years, and we focus on constant improvement of what we do now, which is run the buses, run, run the bus service, the best possible bus service the most customer-oriented bus service we can. Number two is we have developed a lot of plans over the last several years to redesign the, to redesign the bus system that we have now to what we think will be a better system, to a more streamlined system. We would, we would keep the buses on the main roads of the county. We would stop, uh, you know, some of you probably ride routes that kind of do deviations into a neighborhood or into a shopping plaza area or something, and that sometimes takes a lot of time. And so the idea that we've come up with over the years is to take some of those away, but keep the routes running as on sort of straight, direct paths, because that will get to your destination faster. You may have to walk a little bit more because the bus won't go in necessarily, but 
uh, ultimately that will generate more ridership because people will feel like they can get there more directly. We heard a lot of complaints from, especially the folks that are not supportive of green lights, that we have a lot of empty buses or what or very low ridership buses, especially maybe up in North Pinellas County, and that is. Even though there might be a purpose for that, maybe they carried somewhere else in some other part before they came empty. Um, that's a symbol that folks uh, always harp on that we're running inefficiently. We're actually a very efficient system when you compare us to other systems across the country. But obviously we want to do everything we can to maximize the ridership and to where there are low ridership areas, focus on those areas. You're going to hear from Chris Cochran in a second about about how we're going to do that. Number three is very important, though. The idea is that we could do nothing. We, we could feel sorry for ourselves about green light and do nothing and then just cut the service by about a third. Reduce the service by about a third, and there are folks that want to do that. I'm suggesting that, that, would not, that we agree collectively as those who ride the board who supports PSTA, that that would not be a good thing for Pinellas County. We, we, we don't think that that is the, a good thing for the economy, for our people who live here, to cut the service by a third, and we should try to find ways that we can avoid that. I think the board will go for that, but um, you know, I just want to make sure that I want them to say it. So, Number four and five are related to our buses. PSDA has 200 buses, 200 blue and white and green hybrid buses. Some of those are trolley buses, and they're all out that window. Uh, well, no, they're not right now because they're all driving around, but they will be out that window tonight. Um, those buses, after 12 years of running around Pinellas County, get old, and they, according to the federal government, need to be replaced. It's very expensive to replace them every 12 years, but we have to stay on that. If you run the buses longer than 12 years, they break down more, and then that makes customers, they make, it becomes less reliable. And then it also costs us more money to have our maintenance department fix those buses once they break down. So we need a reliable, sustainable bus replacement plan. Buying smaller vehicles that, that are maybe less costly, but um, looking at different kinds of vehicles in the future. Again, focusing on what we have now first as our priority to maintain what we've got now. Not as much of a priority, but at the same time, but of a lesser priority, we do want to look at ways in which we might improve the service and get better service. And, we, and, we, and so I'm proposing that we do that. That we do look to enhanced service in special areas like Central Avenue in St. Petersburg, which is one of it's our highest ridership corridor overall. Or on at spring break right now from Clearwater Beach to downtown Clearwater and then down um, Gulf to Bay Boulevard. Those kinds of services, pilot projects, not a whole big green light thing all at once again, but incrementally, let's see if we can get some of these projects done and then that show people will love it, and then that will spur people on to supporting more transit in the, in the county. Number seven, keep hope alive for the long-term future. The, the, the plan under Greenlight was a good plan. No one, I don't think, really disputes that, that going to a high-frequency service where the buses come much more frequently, you don't have to wait as long, is better than what we got now and that, that run late at night, especially on the weekends, is better than we have now. And that we would still work toward that as the long-term goal. Not in the next two years, unfortunately, but down the road, we wouldn't do anything to preclude that. Number eight is sort of internal baseball, but um, uh, we would make sure that we have the strongest possible communication and track committee that you all are part of, and board committees that keep this as their focus and don't get lost in the weeds or something like that. 
So this this is the path forward that hopefully you know, we went, we've been talking about maybe we need another name, come up with a catchy marketing name for it. I don't know, but this is what I'm recommending to the PSPA board that we we do first. Get this down on paper. Get this approved. Show this is the way we show leadership that we that we approve the policy. And then we start getting into the into the budget and the details. The budget is coming up. We have to meet that, but we we start that process, but we really focus on this high-level stuff first. Now, changing the routes um, is an important process and one that I know the track committee will have a lot of interest in. Um, it gets very complicated, but you all who ride, at least the routes that you ride, you know how it works. And you might, you might have some opinions about this. We do look to have, we look like we have, are going to have a budget shortfall next year. At least preliminarily, we're projecting a, a small budget shortfall. And we need to make, it would be good to make changes to the route structure sooner rather than later so that we can, can be more efficient and close that budget gap. But what I'm recommending down at the bottom is that um, it's okay if we need more time to get the high-level policy, everyone feeling comfortable that we're going in the right direction first. And if we can't work it all out on every single route of what we're going to do, that's okay. We'll, we'll do whatever we can, and then we'll keep working on it to keep, uh, keep making uh, efficiency improvements. You're going to hear now, I'm almost done, uh, from Chris Cochran about how we want to use a very scientific method to reorganizing the routes, using the data, using the ridership and other statistics on helping us make decisions. That's very important. Um, we are looking at the whole county, from Parkland Springs all the way to Gulfport, to look at ways everywhere that we can make things better. But in some areas, we, we are proposing probably dramatic changes, major changes to how the routes work. And so we've come up with this idea called targeted areas that, yes, there might be small changes in some areas, but there might be big changes in areas like downtown St. Petersburg, where we're talking about maybe not having all the buses go to Williams Park, but maybe more of a grid like in the downtown St. Pete area. Up in, in Pinellas Park, changing the way with our new transit center and how that all works together with the the, big, the major routes of 19 and 52 and all that. And then up in northern Pinellas County where we have the connectors. Uh, we've got the Jolly Trolley running, uh, but it only runs on the weekends, etc. Coming up with targeted areas that we'd actually do a lot more planning and maybe even public input in those areas. Last but not least is, of course, the, mo the most important thing. It's called public transit for a reason. The word public is very important. Um, it doesn't matter what all this stuff uh, is about unless the public feels good about it and feels like it, it's a service that they can ride, that it, that it makes sense to them. And so we want to not just do the bare minimum, but we want to exceed on that. So um, it's probably a pretty high level discussion, but I, I wanted to, I'm, I'm going to present this to the, to the PSA board and I want to hear, you guys are like guinea pigs to see if you thought any of this was way off track, or what? Um, does anyone have any thoughts or comments on this approach? I like it. I like the idea that you set in motion the goal first to be hashed out, especially with the new people you've got in the board, and uh, to get them to commit to what the objective, the overall objective is, and then from there to go on to planning and hashing out the uh, how the, the specifics, um, which is where I'm interested in some of the things that you've said, because I'm in North County, and I'm very interested in what you've said there about, uh, you know, what, what, what's, in, what's in store maybe up that way. Yeah, yeah. So, I like it. I second him. I like. The, I really like the way the approach is going. Um, I don't know how feasible this would be, but like if they could do like a, um, like a town hall, they could come to like a town hall meeting 
and I give public, I have a workshop in these little small town halls, like in North County, like Bonita and Tarpon, um, and just have people get the community really involved in like playing contests, like hype it up. To get everybody yeah, which is what your organization has sort of yeah. done, right? Yeah. 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 That's great. I work with Kona, the Council of Neighborhood Associations as well, and we met with the mayor a couple weeks ago, and they have a label how he's restructuring St. Petersburg, but everyone has, you know, like, are we up to par on everything? He's put out a label similar to yours, so that can get the St. Pete's involvement. I know that everyone's really excited about the gun go of just having a label and working towards some improvements, like the water department's doing the same thing. Everyone's made a little target list for a problem here in session, and everyone's meeting that. This is very similar. Yeah. I think you need to work on the name. Um, but just trying to make more neighborhoods be okay with the bus, bus system, I think that's a little more important because they're the ones that shut it down. Like when I heard about green light, and I was, all I heard was the the light rail system. I heard nothing. I knew nothing about the budgeting that needs to come with it. So I was really just impressed when I heard about that. That was your funding. I only got on this board because I was like, oh my god, they don't have a funding anymore. That's what that was for. Nobody knew about that. On that board, hardly anyone that I, I asked about their voting rights, they're just like, no, I just thought it was for this trail thing they wouldn't put on. They didn't know it was for funding, so I think you guys kind of dropped the ball on that. So, yeah. I think this is good. I think it's kind of time of like collecting, collecting ourselves and, and you guys just kind of taking a step back and looking and figuring out where you're going to go instead of just making a bunch of quick decisions. I think it makes sense. Yeah, I, I just, I really wonder that uh, uh, the ideal green light was just dropped so, so quickly. Uh, and and uh, I'm wondering if, uh, is it too cost prohibitive to try it again? Or I, I, I think that it was a matter of strategy. Uh, first of all, why it lost. I, I think it was a matter of strategy and presentation. Uh, like she said, you know, it's like the emphasis was not light rail. As opposed to, you know, it's like an increased uh, bus service, and you know, it's like what this bus service can yeah. do for the average rider. And I just wonder, uh, we we just seem to, we're not talking about green light anymore. We're talking about um, what we can do to, you know, like a, uh, supplement the, the the fact that we don't have green light. And I, I'm just wondering uh, why we wouldn't try it again. Well, again. Um there are some folks who want to do this, but I'm not recommending this. We are still talking about <coughs> the plans that we put in place for green light because we don't, we, at least the polls have shown that that's not what people voted against. Right. They didn't really vote against, they didn't, they didn't think it was a bad plan, like you just said, Catherine, that um, they, did, they weren't aware, or if they were aware, they said, hey, I don't ride the bus, so why should they even go for this? And that... The idea that there's value to people that don't ride the bus to transit, we didn't do a good job. Now, I think you're probably right. There's a lot that the campaign, the advocacy group, maybe didn't do. Uh, but um, but the the core plan for how the uh, how we we're proposing to, to run the buses, um, we're not scrapping that. I mean, th this calls for still staying with those same ideas, but maybe in a more incremental um, thought of it. Let's deal with that. Okay. Um, I was talking to some of my um, friends up in the Northeast, up in here in New York, in um, that area, and I was wondering how feasible this would be if this going against any charters, but what they do in a lot of these areas is they have a, like, a flat rate income tax, like um, up there they do like $1 a week, and then that provides a lot of, it's like supplemental funding. Yeah. So um, I don't know how feasible that would be down here. I don't know. Um, Florida's feasible. pretty awesome. That doesn't have any income tax. But yeah. Yeah. Um, I think we probably want to move on to Chris's thing because some of you might have to catch a bus. <laughs> I'm sorry the buses don't come that late. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a, thank you guys. Thank you very much. Welcome.
welcome uh, new uh, new track members and everybody coming out today. I'm gonna, what we're going to talk about now is this service performance monitoring system that staff has developed to. Um, this is a tool that is going to run parallel with the work program that you just saw. And then as they are developed uh, moving forward, and there's a couple components to it. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the methodology and help you, uh, try to help you understand what went into um, us being able to develop this, this method of, of ranking routes, um, routes performance in, uh, in our system and, and helping to, that will ultimately help in, in making some of these tough decisions down the road. So I'll tell you a little bit about the methodology. I'll show you some of our results. And I'll give you some examples of how we've developed some. We developed the methodology with the goal in mind to ultimately identify these targeted areas for redesign, as Brad mentioned in the previous presentation. And then identifying these, we first want to be able to identify what are the high performing routes. And part of that is understanding what makes them high performing routes so that we can apply those to the low performing routes that we also are able to identify through this methodology. And part of what we'll go into more detail. And the third element of this uh, methodology is being able to use additional tools to forecast what the performance of any redesign that we might be able to do so that we can plug that back into the performance system and see how it would do against today's system so, um, to provide support for showing that it would do much better in, uh, in redesigning it. So there's a couple steps to this. Uh, two steps, uh, we're calling them screens here, screen one and screen two. Uh, the first screen is the performance screen. And this is strictly the whole entire fiscal year 2014 data. So we take our core, per, core performance data, that is the ridership we collect, we know what the cost of our buses per hour are on the road, and we know how much money we get back from the fare box. And, they tell, and we get those to measure the performance of a route. And that, and that criteria is based on a nice balanced measurement of performance based on how many people are riding a bus, but also how much money we are getting back on our passengers per revenue hour and our cost recovery. And these are really just sort of ways to standardize this raw data so we make it apples to apples for different types of routes throughout the system. And keep in mind this passengers per revenue hour is not like a clock hour, single four bus hours in that single hour. So all that is taken account into these uh, criteria. So the second, the, the second sort of sub-step in this first step is taking all of our data, we have these two criteria, the passengers per revenue hour, fare box recovery, um, which is our cost, uh, cost recovery, and they're scored with a possibility of 50 points. Um, and there's a little bit more that goes on in the background, but just know that it's just a, the first time that every route is compared to every other route in the system. It doesn't matter what kind of service it is, if it's trolley or jolly trolley or express route, everything's compared to everything else. Then we do it again, but we put them in, we put them in the ranking category routes are compared to each other. And we do that in each one of their categories and their score. And then we combine those scores. It's basically an average of how that route performed within its category and then against the entire system. So we get a nice sort of is or what the best um, flex connector is. The second step here is much more qualitative. It's important for us to take into account that PSTA's primary mission is as a public service. And that's supported by the board meeting, the board workshop we had on February 18th, economic driver. And you can see there's a lot in the middle here, but it's definitely more towards the public service. So that sort of, that, uh, does it sort of, it definitely supports our, our second step in here in evaluating the econ more of the socioeconomic stuff. Where are people going? So once we identify the low performing routes, what are the options? What can we do? Our last option that we want to do, this methodology sets up the platform for us to evaluate every option on the table. Um, this at all costs not being one of them. The elimination of not as many people that we believe in doing some research are aware of those routes. Can we do more marketing, more branding, and some ongoing monitoring to see what we can do to improve the very important for us to go out. If anything is going to be done, we have to do surveys on the routes. We have to understand why people are riding them. Where are they coming from and where are they going? This is ultimately, if none of this is viable, 
do we have to eliminate? Is there certain historical circumstances where maybe it's been on the chopping block for a long time and it's just, we don't see a feasible way? Some combinations of these categories, and I'll show you some examples in a few minutes. So let's talk about the results. This was the performance um, data for the scoring that I just showed you a minute ago. This is that's very easy to understand for, for us with this scoring system. Um, it's very supportive of our idea of possibly putting money back into the high-performing routes. It's a group of low-performing routes that we need to do more evaluation on. So the 444 is our lowest-performing route in the entire system. And if any of you write it, you know why it's almost two hours a day, uh, two hours frequency between trips. It runs at odd times. Uh, the obvious recommendation here is, is, not, is to first consider eliminating the configuration that it's at and that it currently serves an important area. But can we reallocate it to say the 19 and the 52, which are very good performing routes and they run through that area. And if we could put some of that to transit. And then, again, research potential community partnerships. Are there, are there things that the community can get involved in to help provide access um, in between Tarpon and Booth Ranch? This has been a very, very poor performer from the very beginning. We saw a little bit of growth in the beginning, and it's just been flat. And, you know, research says it's different in, in transit there. It would much better, and our recommendation would be, um, much better served if we were to eliminate that route and reallocate those funds into something more productive. That money into the Oldsmar connector, which we know through our performance measures, is by far the best to, to look at the performance and how what we might want to do with them. The Route 1 and the 30 are also one of the very low performers. Of, and and how we're, we, we still want to keep that vision in mind. And the 1 and the 30 are going to do some more research and look at redesign options, not eliminating them, but the community bus plan actually suggests that people are going. So we can not eliminate it, let's take it to where the people want to go. So that's a, that's a, this is a really good example. The 58, this is an example of a historical one that's been cut in the past, and we don't see it now. And this is one that's definitely on, on the uh, consideration for recommendation of eliminating the current configuration. We do have some other, um, say, uh, the Seminole campus for, for um, uh, St. Pete College, which uh, St. Pete College is very, very, um, um, has it's better anyway. It has better hours, better frequency, and we can take that money and put it into somewhere else um, that would be much more productive. Um, that was done a couple of years ago. And this is another example of a redesign and improve. And this would involve a little bit of additional monitoring and maybe some branding and combining the Jolly Trolley and the 66 and provide 70 out there on the beach communities for tourists. Um, and with our, with our Safety Harbor Jolly Trolley, there's a nice connection, very quick and broad overview of our, of our um, service monitoring system that we're, that we're putting into place. So, and, and it's a lot of information. Um, it's a little complicated, but if you all have any questions, I'll do my best to answer them. Do you have anything on these low-performing routes? You get rid of this one, well, they're not going to have any way to get to 19. So right. Well, that any screen, the second step, requires us to go and do surveys, we look at origin destination. Yet. You know, it's been done yet, so. that is not necessarily, that is something that, that that is, will be an ongoing process. It's something we've started. We do have some surveys from the community bus, uh, the Northeast um, Shopping Center and Tyrone Mall. That's where people were going on that bus, but that wasn't their final destination. A lot of them were going, wanted to ultimately. And I'm aware of what it is, but because of two of the major, 80% of those people would be eligible for DART. Mm -hmm. And for every DART trip, We'll say to and from. I'm not picking on anybody, but Kimberly, every time Kimberly comes to a trip here, a lot of people don't realize that PSTA pays Yellow Cab, pays Care Ride to transport people. And this, and they don't receive any reimbursement of that. This is just something PSTA has to suck up. That's the best way to put it. In other words, paratransit 
has to be paid for by the bus service. Now, I realize there may not be enough. In other words, it may balance out on 444. It might be. Well, 444, there's a lot of things you consider with 444. What? There's, there's going to places that it shouldn't be going anymore. It's Let's not start. being a place that it could be. It's right not, now, we're not saying else. these things are no, going I'm, to I'm be cut. Saying. These are the things that we are, these are the things, this is, this is to let you know that we are identifying these types of things that need to be addressed, and you're right. Uh, and overall average, it's closer to about $28. Okay. Okay. And I know some are more expensive than others, um, but uh, you know, does does putting that money somewhere else and getting additional ridership does that, that revenue that, balance? And that's part of that second step in and, researching and that that, that payoff. So, yeah. What's Jolly Trolley's ownership? What are the owners of Jolly Trolley? How much input do they have? In other words, they can do like they did before. They could say tomorrow all Jolly Trolleys go to the garage and, or go to the barn and don't come out again. Well, there is a, a, there is a contract. I know there's a contract. You know, that's, um, you know, that's, a, that's something we renew and, and on a continual basis. Year. So that's, you know, a, 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 a yearly contract? I, I, I'm not sure. I'm sorry. I, I, just have, oh, I just have two questions, quick questions. Yes. Right. Uh, the first one is uh, when people get on and off the bus, mm -hmm. and you're talking about data that you collect on ridership and so on, is there, I mean, do you know how many people get on a bus and get off a bus in a day when they're running through the things? That's what they're, they're, the, the counters that we have, they... <clears throat> We get data two different ways. We, we, it's counted by the fare box. So every right. time someone puts money in and swipes, it's counted that way. We also have um, the buses that have the, eight, the automatic passage and counters. It's a laser. And there's two little lasers. So if, if you're going on the bus and this laser goes off first and this one's second within you know, less than a second, it knows that's somebody getting on. If, it, if it's this one on the inside that goes first, it knows it's somebody getting off. Out the back door, I believe there are lasers on the back door as well, and they and it's a, it's very um, there's a very um, um, intensive statistical analysis that goes on. It takes into account how many times a driver gets on during the day and off, and and, and estimates. But that those two work together for us to estimate ridership. Okay. So it'll never be a hundred percent accurate, yeah. but it gives okay. us a very you know when you're talking forty thousand riders a day, it gives us a statistically significant accurate. Okay, so you've got you've got some data, maybe suspect at times, but it's good. It's data. It's very you, good. You it's measure. as good as any other system in the country. Okay, process. and then the other question that I have is on the uh, procedure that you've established mm -hmm. for evaluating <coughs> routes for route changes and you know the, the uh, on those lower on those lower performing uh, routes. Um, and you, you've got the stash, excuse me, stash, staff uh, recommendation on some of those lower ones, mm -hmm. all right? Informing those staff evaluations, recommendations, have, I mean, why don't you come to us? That's what, be rest assured, you all will be very, very involved in this process as it moves forward. You all are the representatives of the rider, as well as their, as I, as I mentioned before, public outreach will be a huge part of this. We are required, first of all, by law for major changes to go out and address the public and let them be heard. But that's what this committee is for. Yes, Cassandra? You think about, about it like the scientific process. So if this is based on what we've done so far, this is the theory of what we think ought to be done. We're then going to go out and collect more data, continue to talk to people, and make sure that that's, that is what our final recommendation is. So this is an opening in, in each example that Chris gave. That is the opening. And then we'll talk about it before we actually take any action. 
Like if this drives that work plan that the board will continually develop. I wasn't and, being and a wise guy. I was just asking. <laughs> no, no, I think it's a good question. question. No, it's, it is a great question. Because we, we do want to be inclusive and make sure that everybody understands that when we when we do make changes, if we make changes, that there is a process of public dialogue. Um, this is about the... Um, Sorry, DW. Uh, I, I just naturally went <laughs> in order around. <laughs> Uh, this is about the um, 66 Jolly Charlie. Yes. Um, <coughs> that was pretty much when we went out and talked to people. What you said is like almost exactly what people wanted. Was um, they wanted like a hybrid system with the bus and the trolley coming in every day, because like a lot of tourists use the trolley and a lot of workers use the bus, and be able to like hold an hour on each and then synchronize them 30 minutes apart would be really good. Mm -hmm. But um, like something like PSA could probably do now that would probably increase ridership was when we talk to people, um, a really big thing is that when Jolly Charlie comes to the Clearwater Beach, it goes to the Publix, but it doesn't go to Pier 60. Mm -hmm. So if they could do that, that's like a 0.8 mile um, stent. So like when the trolley leaves out of the Publix instead of going straight back into downtown, if they could just have a quick deviation with one stop at Pier 60 come back and give people a connection from their city to Clearwater Beach, I think that'd be a really big thing. I don't know. You get a lot of more, like some more, at least some more. You do have to like, transfer in front of Iron yeah. Grill or something. Yeah, and a lot of people who drive, drive for the first time don't like that because like sometimes they bring the Zach there mm -hmm. and they have to get more money. And, and it's so, a pretty good hike from Island Lake Grill yeah. and Publix down to, the, to Pier 60. Yeah. yeah, so like I think that's pretty Especially like, if you're carrying very much. Yeah, so I think that should be like a, you know, a quick, something we can do like um, in the short term. Okay. That would be good to consider. Good idea. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, just, uh, uh, I would comment that um, as uh, St. Petersburg uh, develops downtown, mm -hmm. um, most of the, uh, the fare and, and the ridership is going to probably be concentrated on the south side because the, the north side is developing and you have condos uh, going for the low 200s and whatever, and, and, and people with the population anymore is being pushed on the south side, and so they can find affordable housing on the south side. That's why uh, uh, the 1 and the 30 combining is not a bad idea if it's going to be a cross-town bus, uh, and the south side is pretty much under certainty. Uh, other than the 4, um, going towards, uh, uh, going west, uh, southwest, you can't you can't get a bus that's going across town. It's like after seven thirty, eight o'clock, and so you know uh, if the uh, one and the thirty uh, combined and they serve the south side, uh, what route would it take, or or would we be asked to uh, uh, contribute um, uh, to the you know it's like proposed uh, any proposed route? Um, yeah. I I think, as Cassandra had mentioned, as we, you know, these are very just sort of the, the first opening of the dialogue. When, as these processes move forward, as the board solidifies its direction and how they want to do things and things start happening, the track committee is part, is a huge part of that public engagement as you are representatives of the riders, not to mention our need to go out and survey the people on those buses to find out we need to, it's very important for us to know exactly where they are going because as you said, we can't, we, we have to still provide them options, viable options on where to go. And, and the one in the 30 was a great, uh, I think it was the 30, the 30 is a, a, a half hour connection between Tyro Mall and Northeast Shopping Center, correct? So that was, a lot of people ride it that way because it's a 30 minute. The only other one seat ride was about 50 minutes. But the one and the 30 combining with the four, you can get there almost in the same amount of time if you connect the four. And of course, that's all part of the scheduling to make sure that they connect together so people can transfer. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a it's a process that that is sort of incremental as things come. We realize that uh, as changes are made, there are decisions to be made and how people are still being able to connect to the important activity centers that people are going. Um, and, and part of all of this is making it more efficient and, and serving um, 
you know, just being more efficient in how we serve those activity centers and where people really do want to go. Putting more people on the bus. Does that, does that make sense yeah. to answer your question? Okay. If, if we have one particular route, route that we have suggestions on or whatever, at this point, do we want to just wait for you guys to come to us? Or is there should we contact somebody and specifically um, discuss one particular route that we have interest in? But you guys are always welcome to make suggestions to us. That's that's part of why you're here, and, and you know, PSTA is always... Well, I just know you guys yeah. know you can always contact us with, with your questions or suggestions to, mm -hmm. to look at that. So that's part of this process. And we're, just because just we, we don't just wait to change something and go talk to the public. It's, it's, it should always be an open dialogue. On that very subject that just there that mm -hmm. you're talking about, would it be appropriate and okay if I was to say to <coughs> those that are involved in the planning mm -hmm. of the routes, of the routes, uh, that I would like to meet with them and maybe anybody else that you know is interested in that. I have some very, I, I can tell you that, that I, I have some ideas backed by my own data that I did, mm -hmm. all right, on your East Lake core, uh, your East Lake connector, mm -hmm. and the, the other one that are in those, that low tier. And there are a lot of things that are operating with those routes, that, those routes, uh, that, and the way they were designed, and the people that are, you know, people that, can use those routes mm -hmm. uh, that partly the result of your poor ridership. Okay. And I want, so my question would be, would I would it be appropriate? Is it okay for, you know, you just mentioned we can always contact mm -hmm. you, all right? I really don't want to have to sit down and uh, uh, come up with a map and graphs and all that kind of stuff. I would like to know if I, it would be okay if I said to you, say, hey, look, I'd like to meet with you. Uh, I'm available on such and such a day. I'd like to meet with anybody else, Absolutely. get my ideas out there. Yes. Would that be appropriate? Yes. You wouldn't be the first person that we sat down with one on one that All came right. in. And, and Chris, and can I add to that? I would like to recommend, or at least create a little bit of a policy toward that. I would like to recommend that if you have something specific that you want to address, you first email that to them because that way if there are two or three people who are interested in the same area or the same right. route, then they can consolidate that. You should also be aware because of the Sunshine Laws, anytime two or more of our committee members meet with staff at the same time, it has to be posted. So if you can email them that, whatever you're interested in, I please just do. hope it doesn't end up being a big task to make the email. All right. I mean, it's pretty Just simple. let them know what area or route you're okay. interested in. You All know, right. if there's like a specific geographic area you're interested in or a specific route like you were talking about that you'd really like to talk to someone about, who would be the first person to reach out to, Brad? Would that be Chris that would yeah. organize that? I yeah. would be happy yeah. to take your emails, and I'm very good yeah. at answering my emails. Okay. Uh, so I'm, right. uh, I'm put track committee in the subject, and I will know that it's uh, that. I'd also like to say, I, myself and Vivian both attended the board workshop that was held in February. Yeah. And consistently throughout the day, the same thing I kept hearing from the board members as they worked through all of the, this beginning initiation of what we're going to do as next steps is how important it was to get the writer's input and the writer's perspective. And I, I completely concur with Chris and what Sandra said. This is a beginning. I mean, this is the initial phase of what, what the PSTA is looking at doing in order to determine next steps. And the role that the track plays is going to be extremely important right now, not only to the PSTA, but the board, as they work through this and start determining where we're going to go from here. So all of this input is very important, and your participation is hugely appreciated. Just mentioned downtown St. Petersburg is having greater travel demand. I was just curious how travel demand is calculated, or is it just based off of ridership? Is, there is a regional um, regional travel demand model that has been done um, very recently, in fact, um, and uh, um, that is 
those numbers are, re those ideas and observations are reflective of that. And it's not necessarily only transit. It takes into account um, all modes of all modes of movement and transportation where people are going. So you know, if you uh, the the I think and, and I think this is um, reflective of transit. If you give them that option with viable accessibility, good frequency, good hours, um, if that's where people want to go and they have the option of reliable transit, that you're just going to get more riders. So, um, yeah. I, I don't know if you know, like, I guess Brad would probably know more about this, but about the uh, bus rapid transit project and CP. Um, I was just wondering, like, what kind of uh, BRT that would be, like, dedicated corridor, mixed use, or, like, they have over in Tampa. Chris does know that too, but um, we're talking about um, similar to what they have over in Tampa, uh, but probably, I mean, similar stations, probably most of the quarter, but maybe not all of it, having um, it in with the existing traffic. Maybe parts of St. Pete on First Avenue North and South, the uh, dedicated lane, though, and then. What will be different than the hard one is that the vehicles will be look different. Like they'll look different. They'll be articulated. the longer articulated buses, hopefully, and um, look like a BRT. That'd be cool. Yeah. Like a, that would be cool. I'd grab a lot of Hopefully, it'll stand out. Yeah. So that people know that if they want to go slow, they take the trolley. If they want to go fast, they take it's, and the vehicle looks fast. You all will be hearing lots more about this, um, and if you have any, you know, we're, we're, we're getting on in time and we still have a little bit more to cover, uh, but my, uh, uh, feel free to email me, call me, um, and, um, or anyone that's planning, we'll do everything we can to help explain this, and we're obviously open to your suggestions, as, as uh, Ian mentioned, so thank you for listening. Thank you, Chris. Do we have any other business? Anything anyone else wants to bring up that we have to cover? Did we uh, ever decide on a time where we're going to talk about the uh, uh, the writer? What was it? The writer? Uh, Code of conduct. Uh, Code of conduct. Yeah. It looks like that is a future meeting subject according to our um, agenda, so perhaps we can get that onto the schedule next week. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and plus we were, uh, uh, they had morphed into to a conversation about uh, uh, drivers and the code of conduct mm -hmm. for drivers. You know, yeah. I was wondering, Brad, could we have whoever does the training for the drivers come in and perhaps discuss some of the training aspects that drivers go through and maybe have, I know we might have to pull somebody off the route, or, but is there a way we can have a driver come in so that we can speak to them as well? Yeah. Just so we get, so we have a better understanding of their experience of being on a bus, you know, eight hours a day or ten hours a day and, and get a little bit of a feel for that. Be and the reason for a National bus driver appreciation. Day, Absolutely. Which is yeah. Tomorrow. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. 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 You know, I think that's a, a, a great idea. Of course, you know, we have, uh, when you talk about a driver code of conduct, we have a 75 page manual on all the rules and regulations that every bus driver has to commit to memory and know, you know what, they, what the rules of PSVA are. Of course, they need to know all the driving laws and all that. Um, so we've got that pretty well covered, um, but if there's, I think Elaine's got a comment about the, the training process. Or maybe you have some ideas on making that better. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Of course I do. Okay. Great. Thank you. That's a good yeah. suggestion. All right. Um, that's, I think that's it. Unless anyone has anyone else thing you want to add, Brad? Anything else? On the video go. Oh, oh good. So now we can party. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Oh, it died. It died. Okay, so I have to
Anytime. Yeah, it's my guess, because I think that's really helpful. Uh, another question I'm 